The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All-Hit Radio! Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the x everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the x It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And you know what? The x comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to give us a call tonight, toll-free number is one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. That is toll-free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. Our email address, xzone at talkstarradio.com. On MSN Messenger, talkstarradio at hotmail.com. And, of course, our website's www.xzoneradio.com and xzonetv.com. My producer tonight at Master Control is the one and only Miss Melanie. And our chat room moderator from Scarborough, Ontario, is our friend Rob. On tonight's show, Doug Elwell will be joining me after the first commercial break. We're going to be talking about the mysterious world, and we're going to focus tonight on Ireland. In hour number two, we have Colleen Dietzman and Paul Bowersock. We're going to be talking about their new book, Seeing in the Dark, Claim Your Own Shamanic Power Now and in the Coming Age. Hour number three has Canada's own Edgar Casey with us. Douglas James Cottrell will be with us. And in hour number four, Brian O'Day. He is the uh, executive producer of the hit TV series, Creepy Canada. But Brian's going to be with us tonight talking about another hit that he has. It's his book entitled Hi. So I'm looking forward to speaking to Brian again, as well as Douglas James Cottrell, and in hour number two, Colleen Dietzman and Paul Bowersox. And in uh, right after the first commercial break that we're going to be having very shortly, Doug Elwell. Today is, let me see, uh, April the 16th. It is Thursday. And on this date in 1922, Annie Oakley hits 100 clay targets in a row at Pinehurst, uh, North Carolina. In 1929, the New York Yankees became the first baseball team to add numbers to their uniforms. On this date in 1935, Fibber McGee and Molly debuted on radio. In 1956, solar-powered radios went on sale for the first time. And the great one... Wayne Gretzky from Brantford, Ontario, retired from hockey on this date in 1999 to enjoy a relaxing, less stressful life. Today is uh, Peter Billingsley's birthday. Ralphie in A Christmas Story turns 38. John Cryer from the show Two and a Half Men turns uh, 44 today. And uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar turns 62 today. That's 20 years for each name. Men's Health uh, came out with the following survey, whether the economy is stalled, recessed, or downright depressed. It's doing more than shaking up our portfolios. It's changing our perspective on wealth, family, and happiness. Now, here's uh, how you've been hit and how you intend to recover. Uh, 45% of the those surveyed said the souring economy had no impact on their financial uh, lives personally. 31% of the souring economy uh, said that their personal finances have gotten moderately worse. And uh, we're going to continue this as with the night goes on because there's some very fascinating statistics in this survey that I'm sure you, the Exxon Nation, will be very interested to hear. When I come back from our first commercial break in two minutes, Doug Elwell will be joining me. We're going to be talking about Mysterious World, Ireland. My name is Rob McConnell, and this is the Exxon. For Thursday, April the 16th in the year 2009, live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada.
Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.x. ZBN.net. one 877 Toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. Doug Elwell is my special guest this hour. Mysterious World is a quarterly online travel guide to exotic travel destinations around the world that focuses on providing you all the information you need to truly appreciate what these travel destinations have to offer. More than just a standard travel guide to standard travel destinations, however, Mysterious World focuses on bringing you cutting-edge information about travel destinations that have a certain mystery about them. To this end, Mysterious World provides you with all the relevant historical, archaeological, and travel information, as well as biological information about famous people and artifacts related to these famous locales that you need to make your travel experience complete. And Mysterious World is more than just a travel guide. It is also an online journal where writers can submit research articles and essays on various topics, such as ancient history, religion, and mythology for publication. If you'd like to submit an article for publication or become a Mysterious World reporter, you you can contact the fine people at Mysterious World by sending an email to publisher at mysteriousworld.com to learn more. Mysterious World is owned and operated by Doug Elwell, Inc., a marketing communications consultancy based in the suburbs of Chicago. And joining me now is the one and only Doug Elwell. Hey, Doug, how are you tonight? Very good. I'm one and only, huh? (laughs) One and only. One and only. All right, Doug, uh, last time you were with us, we talked about an Ireland that not too many people, you know, are aware of. We talked about the normal stuff about, uh, let me see... um, St. Patrick, we talked about the um, the different locations in Ireland and what people should look for. And we talked about, uh, let me see, uh, sea monsters. We talked about ghosts. We talked about, oh, a whole plethora of mysterious Ireland facts that not too many people are aware of. And that is what people can find out when they go to your website, right? That's correct. You can go to www.mysteriousworld.com or we have an Ireland website at uh, http colon slash slash ireland dot mysterious world dot com. Now, Doug, what are some of the other locations that Mysterious World writes about? Mysterious World pretty much covers the entire world. That was our initial idea and scope. I'd start off by myself, but I've had some additional writers uh, contact me, mm-hmm. and we've had some more and more people write. The most prominent of which was a, uh, a travel writer from England named Ian Middleton. Uh, he was the primary author for Mysterious World. He did a fantastic job. We actually have excerpts of it on our, our uh, website, uh, mysteriousworld.com. And I was reading through it. It's really quite entertaining, actually. You get to read his travelogue. Mm-hmm. He starts at the National Museum of Ireland and basically moves in a, in a spiral outwards, uh, you know, of course, uh, clockwise, because mm-hmm. counterclockwise is bad luck, and, according to the Celtic thought. And um, he basically travels all four corners of, of the island 
trying to find all these great mysterious places. He, uh, he originally uh, wanted to find, uh, didn't expect to spend more than a couple of weeks, but he ended up spending over three months covering absolutely everything, and he does a wonderful job of it. Now, Doug, with all the research that you've done, where in Ireland is it the most mysterious? Well, I don't know. I, I don't think uh, there is any one particular place, but if I had to choose, I would choose Newgrange because it's such a huge megalithic structure and so interesting. Uh, it's a, basically a gigantic pile of well, carefully arranged flagstones, type stones, mm -hmm. uh, piled up in a huge kind of low mound, shaped actually something like a flying saucer, except without a curve in the bottom. And uh, it's aligned to the, uh, I think it's the, the rising sun on the spring equinox. I don't recall exactly. But it's actually older than the pyramids, and I believe actually uh, comparable in width and diameter. An absolutely fantastic uh, very popular tourist destination, and there are many other mounds near it that are also very fascinating. Is there any relation to that place and Stonehenge, and how does it differ in size from Stonehenge? Now, Stonehenge is actually not that large. The stones are big, but the, the actual circle I don't think is more than a few hundred feet across, maybe hmm. less than that. I haven't really studied Stonehenge much, but uh, Newgrange is, is huge. It's, uh, I think, uh, get an exact dimension for you, but it's hundreds, a couple hundred feet across in diameter, very big. Uh, a very impressive structure. What it was the uh, the origin of the structure, and why was it built? Uh, it's not really sure the origin or the the reason. Probably having to do with the religion, mm -hmm. because it is lined up with the, with the rising sun, and the Celts and most ancient peoples, except for only really the Israelites, uh, believe that uh, in order to gain power and uh, and ensure the, their future and their success, they needed to align themselves with natural forces. So they would uh, align themselves with the sun, the movements of the sun and the moon, which are also their manifestations of their gods. And so it's only natural that uh, in this uh, kind of uh, mindset would inevitably result in the creation of large structures that would try to mirror the uh, the movements of the sun, moon, and stars, and uh, and and other and, and weather and and time and space and everything, trying to understand the the great mystery. And and as such, they believe they derived. Uh, numinous power from from uh, the sun and the moon, which helped them survive uh, danger and um, uh, helped them reproduce more more readily and and uh, make sure the crops came in on time and so forth. It also it also sounds very familiar about the pyramids, where there were shafts uh, uh, that actually point directly to certain constellations that uh, archaeologists believe that the pharaohs. Uh, would use these as the way for the soul to escape. To uh, some people uh, believe that, yeah. yeah. Uh, some people believe that uh, it was uh, uh, just a way for the, uh, the the Pharaoh's soul to return to the stars. And That's the pyramid texts actually talk about that. How they say the soul of the, of the Pharaoh is a star, and he wants to return to the heavens and so forth. And uh, the Great Pyramid is actually the. Uh, I believe the uh, the northern there are the two major quote unquote air shafts uh, point towards uh, one of them points towards Orion's Belt I believe and I think the other one points towards Polaris very accurately actually it's either, it's either one of the star shafts or the, the front entrance I forget which uh, but some people believe uh, recently in Ireland that uh, some of the constant uh, some some of the Mounds and monuments in the uh, Tower of Valley are actually aligned to make a huge map of the constellation of Orion, which is uh, like the pyramids, uh, as many people believe now, uh, more and more so people believe, that the uh, pyramids were laid out to mimic the belt stars of Orion. In the ancient world, Orion was maybe the most important constellation because it was uh, the most prominent and it also kind of symbolized uh, 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 deity. It was, it was uh, kind of a. In one of our one of, one of my uh, stories that I wrote on uh, King Nimrod, a great king of the ancient world, uh, Nimrod is routinely uh, related to the constellation of Orion, and and in occult history and and, and other histories, Orion has held a prominent role as well. How so, you, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's no there's no there's no, uh, no surprise that it is mimicked in uh, architecture not only in uh, Egypt but also possibly in Ireland. Is there a connection between Egypt and Ireland uh, that that is starting to surface now as we further investigate the archaeological finds that are popping up in in Egypt? 
archaeologically speaking, it's difficult to find connections, but uh, mythological, or not mythological, but um, according to uh, Irish histories, mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, some of the, the Irish peoples actually lived in Egypt for, uh, for quite a time, particularly the, uh, the I think it's the, um, was it the one of the, you know, the, Numid- the Numidians, or which were like a, a Scythian people who came from Central Asia and uh, actually had uh, trade and other close cultural relations with Egypt. Uh, according to the Irish history, so the Irish annals. And they actually emigrated uh, from uh, Egypt to Ireland. And some people even think that possibly uh, the Mound of Tara was named after uh, an Egyptian queen. Where does your interest in mysterious places come from, Doug? I don't know. I, just, I have to... Well, I do know, actually. The, uh, the need is to understand the great mystery, what, who we are, why mm-hmm. we are here, I mean, what's the point? Are we here just to to work and then die? This has got to be something more. Um, so I've I've always had a powerful need to learn and understand the world I live in. And the more I understand, the more I study it, the more mysterious I realize it is. So, mysterious world has kind of been a labor of love for me and for the past. Uh, actually, it's been a, almost eleven years now. We've been doing publishing on and off whenever we can. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, for me, that's always it's been a great source of joy to do something besides just work. So something where I can share my love of history with others, and I've had a tremendous time of it. What has been your your um, most surprising discovery? I would say uh, most recently, when I was doing some research into the concept of monatomic gold, uh, where one of our next uh, series is uh, going to be on the temples. Mm-hmm. Of Israel and the, ta- and the tabernacle. I was interested in some of the writings of Lawrence Gardner, particularly uh, his, uh, his writings about the Ark of the Covenant. I forget the exact title of the book, but he had a very interesting idea about how somehow this mysterious form of gold called monatomic gold was somehow the power source for the Ark and, and uh, also a very important part of ancient uh, priestly uh, uh, rituals. And I thought the idea was, you know, kind of ludicrous or at least weird. Mm-hmm. When I looked into it, uh, and actually went into the original Hebrew, actually I have a master's in Old Testament biblical studies from Wheaton College, so I, I was able to read the original, the Old Testament and the original Hebrew, and I, I'm finding repeated references to this mysterious white powder, uh, which is related to, to Israeli ritual. Is is that what they used to also call as manna? Actually, uh, yes, I believe the manna was actually partly made of this manna mm-hmm. yeah. and I've been able to find relationships. Uh, with uh, the landing of God on Mount Sinai, and he did land in some sort of vehicle, by the way, uh, according to, to the uh, Psalms. Uh, when you cross-check them with uh, Exodus, it, it, God actually came down on Mount Sinai in some sort of heavenly chariot. And it, uh, and the, uh, when, it, when it's described of God coming down to Mount Sinai, it said that fire came down from beneath him, and it melted the mountaintop. And my theory was that... Uh, the Egyptian treasure was stored up there, mm-hmm. and all the, a lot of gold, because they had actually had a, an entire mercenary army up there guarding it. And my theory is when he landed on the top of the mountain, he he melted all the gold in and transformed it into this monatomic form. It went Doug, up in sta- the air Doug, and fell down as manna. Doug, stand by. We've got to take a commercial break. Doug Elwell's our special guest. www.ireland.mysteriousworld. Com. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as the Exxon continues live and around the world right here on the Talkstar Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, 
Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, sense this product is a real winner to learn more about 123 ready tv visit our website at www.xzbn.net welcome back everyone doug lol is our special guest and doug uh, tell me having had the opportunity of learning uh, how to read the ancient text how to, how different are the texts compared to the bible itself the translated version Actually, you'd be surprised how different some of these translations are. Not to say that they're wrong as much as they are shallow. Mm-hmm. Like I was saying before, uh, a lot of a lot of people uh, ignore the fact, like in Psalm 68:17, it says that uh, God has chariots. Uh, the chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of thousands, and he uh, they were they were accompanying him to, when he landed on Mount Sinai. Who would have thought that uh, it could refer to you know? some kind of spacecraft, but that's what it literally says. And so they, what they quite often do is they kind of gloss it over with fair-sounding rhetoric and kind of poetic uh, notions, which is fine, but if we're missing out on some very important points, I think that's uh, a serious problem. It certainly is. Absolutely. And that with the monatomic gold and, mm-hmm. and some possibly, and with some other ideas I have about, I've, I've researched, possibly uh, references to Margellans as well. To Margellans. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, I can get into that if you'd like. Oh yeah, because you know I I've had done many shows on Morgellons disease, and it's a it maybe a very serious problem coming soon, even more so than it is now. Could this be one of the plagues that was uh, talked about in the Bible? I believe it is the worst of the plagues that was talked about in the Bible. Interesting. And I believe it will return in the end times as well. I believe it's prominent at the uh, Garden of Eden, at the Exodus, and in the end times. Uh, in, the, in the book of Exodus, there's repeated references to the plague of Egypt, mm-hmm. which would manifest itself as a as a raised red boil out of which grow hairs. Ah. It's called Zarat, and uh, it's a ser- so such a serious plague that an entire book of Leviticus, I think it's 14 or 15, I'll have to look it up, describes how to cure it. And then there's no, nothing else in the Bible, or at least Leviticus, talks at length about uh, diseases except for this one, which is extremely pernicious. And grows not only on man and beast, but also in uh, material objects like houses. And so you could typically tr- mistranslate it as leprosy, but leprosy does not—it doesn't cause you to sprout hairs growing from your from wounds on your body. And there's also, if you're if you're familiar with the Book of Revelation, yes. one of the last plagues is that men are afflicted with terrible sores all over their body, just sounding very much like uh, not only the Zarat but also Mergellans. Um uh, and moreover, when I did more research, I did, and this mm-hmm. is all part of, came out of my original uh, desire to, to, to debunk, or at least try to figure out what uh, uh, the, the monatomic gold concept of, of, and the Ark of the Covenant. I figured it was, you know, it was nonsense, but the more I studied, the more realistic I thought it, it was possible. Monatomic elements do exist. A monatomic gold, if it's, if it's possible, would simply mean that it's a form of gold where the atomic bonds between atoms are severed, and it basically each atom falls into a pile, a disassociated pile that looks like white powder. 
but uh, the, the references to, to Zarat, I think, believe actually, or to Margellans, actually start in uh, Genesis 3 uh, and 4, where the, the curse of Eden, it literally says, uh, it's currently translated, thorns and thistles will grow out of the ground, and you will, you will um, bake bread by the sweat of your brow. But what it actually says in the Hebrew is, thorns and thistles will grow out of your skin, mm-hmm. and you'll bake bread by the sweat of your brow, leading me to believe, possibly, that this part of what Satan taught, uh, taught them when they, when they ate the apple was actually more of a transfer of, of knowledge. Satan taught them how to do what we consider to be high technology, so they were actually probably very technologically advanced and very wise, being the first humans. They were probably like supermen, like from, from our perspective. And um, my theory is, is that one of the things he taught them was nanotechnology. And one of these experiments got out of hand, and it became known as uh, a terrible disease, which self-replicated and basically covered the earth uh, over time and became the curse of Eden. And if mankind didn't protect themselves carefully, this stuff would get inside of their bodies, like Morgellon says again, and that would be a terrible curse on them. But he also says in the same verse, you'll bake bread by the sweat of your brow. I believe that the, the divine bread of gold is the cure for the Margellans and, and the means by which Adam and Eve were able to survive. That's my theory. And uh, it bears out because the, 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 uh, when you, once again in the book of Exodus, you have the problem with the disease, but you also have the, the divine bread falling from heaven. So you have the opposition of the, of the disease that comes from the ground and the, the, head comes, and the bread that comes from the heavens. And the two seem to cancel each other out because, if you recall, when the manna, if they didn't eat it immediately after one day, these tiny red worms came from the ground and devoured it. This is probably a reference to the to the disease, you know, kind of neutralizing the, the effect of the manna. So I thought that was it was interesting, and it seems to be a recurrent theme of this disease constantly undermining man, but this bread constantly saving him. Uh, all the way from the beginning, in the garden when it was the curse was pronounced on the serpent. You will eat dust all the days of your life, and you will bruise man's heel, but he will crush your head. This is a man's a man walking, but the serpent constantly trying to undermine him. I think it's a metaphor for mm-hmm. for gallants, and I think it comes back occasionally. You know, I I I, I think that taking the Bible word for word is is a mistake that a lot of people make. I think there's a lot of metaphors and and don't forget the Bible was written for people who were not as advanced as we were. Well, I I don't know that about that anymore because if we're saying there's so much lost technology that's now being found that the ancients had access to, maybe we have to stop and take another look at what we believe to be right and look at what it may be right, may be wrong. I believe you're correct. I, uh, personally, I believe there, was, there have been periods of relatively high technology that come in cycles, mm-hmm. mostly under the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rise of various empires who could afford to um, fund uh, what we would call R&D in the various technologies, mostly for war, but for other uses as well. And you have a lot of these uh, instances. For example, King Midas, um, they, with a Baghdad battery, uh, they, they found what they That's believe right, yeah. possible battery. They found if you put ser- several of these in, in parallel, you could generate enough uh, electricity to do electroplating. And some have theorized that this is how King Midas got his Midas touch. He didn't turn stuff into gold. He just electroplated it. Uh, so they, there's a possibility they may have had um, um, a knowledge of electricity, maybe not as advanced as ours, but still a knowledge there. And of course, you have the, the uh, hieroglyphs in Tendera with the giant with a light bulb, mm-hmm. well, thing which looks like a light bulb, and it really does. Uh, impossible to prove, but very intriguing to say the least. And I personally believe another thing that people don't consider is the Book of Enoch. Uh, you've probably heard of that or read it or something about it. And in the Book of Enoch, it was, a, it was an apocryphal book of, of the Bible. Um, almost got included in the canon, but we didn't, we didn't have a reliable enough copy, so it was left out as a, as a good apocryphal book, which is, really should be studied. And in that book, it, is, it talks in detail about how the fallen angels came down from heaven, or were thrown down, it's not clear. Um, and they gave gifts of technology to mankind. All the arts, literature, sciences, everything we understand as learning and knowledge was given to us intact 
by the fallen angels, according to the Book of Enoch. And yet, when you listen to fables about the lost continent of Atlantis, it's the same thing. In Atlantis, the the uh, gods came down from uh, from heaven and gave man technology. That's just That's what the Greeks yeah. um, it say as well. It's ubiquitous uh, uh, everywhere. In your opinion, who was the devil? In my opinion, the devil was and is a powerful spirit being who was became arrogant and attempted to usurp the throne of a, of a all-powerful deity of, or being of some kind. I believe in the Bible, mm-hmm. but I won't. I won't. Um, try to force my opinion on you or others. But that's, generically speaking, what I think happened. And there was a conflict, and even though this being Satan was powerful, he was not powerful enough, and so he was cast down. Naturally, if you're in rebellion, either you go with the program or you, you uh, go somewhere else and try it your own way, which is what happened. And he came down to Earth to, to uh, found his own kingdom, and he's been here ever since. I'm not sure if he's all spirit or all flesh or a bit of both. It's not really clear. But whoever he is, is very powerful and very dangerous being. Doug, let me throw this hypothetical situation to you. Mm-hmm. Let us say that the events as depicted in the Bible had not happened yet. But now they're happening with our knowledge of science, our knowledge of astronomy, our, sci- our knowledge of quantum physics, chemistry, biology. How do you think, how do you think the Bible would differ if it was happening now? Yes. You mean starting from Genesis 1 or the end times? Um, let's go with Genesis 1. I think that not we're not starting. I think we're repeating an old cycle. Uh, it's a regular cycle. I believe it, uh, it happened around the time of Abraham and mm-hmm. possibly the Exodus. It may have happened in more ancient times, say around 10,000 B.C., when some people think Atlantis was destroyed and the Ice Age was basically destroying all civilization on Earth or the, the end of the Ice Age, more, more accurately, because there was a great deal of flooding. And uh, an even older time, which may have been the, uh, the Edenic time, which there was an also, also a, during the, before the flood, when there was a, uh, a similar high civilization to what we have now, maybe even better in some ways. I suspect it may have been better. Um, but I think not so much in terms of we're starting it now, but we're repeating a cycle. And uh, the second coming will... In my opinion, end that cycle, end that destructive cycle, and hopefully, I believe, bring us to a period of permanent peace. We, you know, in the in the book of Revelations, it talks about Armageddon. It talks about destruction. It talks about 144,000 will be taken. Mm-hmm. Are we talking metaphorically here? Or are we talking fact? I think it's literal. I think it's literal. And believe it or not, I'm beginning to think that uh, uh, God and the angels may be related to the UFO phenomenon as well. Mm-hmm. There are two, uh, basically, I believe the what we call aliens are actually rebel angels who stole technology from God, including some of those, some of uh, you know what we call flying saucers or ships or whatever. Right. And they're basically making things as difficult as possible as they can for him, but eventually they will lose. In the process of my concern is they'll try to take us down with them. If these things... And that's the problem. I'm not sure if it's just all hokum and a waste of time or if it's really a problem. Should we really be looking at it and seriously considering it? Um, when I talk about these things myself, I think, you know, do I really believe this? This sounds silly. But then again, something in my heart tells me there's something definitely there. So it's... Always follow your heart. Got to work, Yeah, got to follow your heart and at least... If you don't believe it outright, at least consider it. That's right. Doug Elwell is our special guest. Ireland.mysteriousworld.com. Are you planning on any excursions to the Holy Land or to Egypt, Doug? Probably not in the near future. Um, maybe I'd love to go to Egypt or the Holy Land or both. Mm-hmm. People often do both. It's something I have to save up for. Right now, I have other things to be concerned about, particularly with the economy. Now, I have to be careful with every penny. Sure. So uh, we'll, we're probably going to we're going to continue. Uh, last year we uh, only published one issue. I think we're going to move that to this issue, to this year, and start publishing our cycle on what I call the Exodus Revelation, which is talking about the monatomic gold and the, and the theories about Rogellons and 
in high technology in ancient times. That that connection you made with Morgellons is a very interesting one. I've never heard of that before. If you read the Leviticus, I can find the exact uh, the exact verse for you. It sounds remarkably like Morgellons. And uh, something about Morgellons, it just it it hit me as being you know, It sounds a lot like kind of an end time disease because it was so wrong. I mean, mm-hmm. what it did to people is nasty. And the theories about the, the Morgellons, people when that many people actually analyzed it, it appears to have technological qualities. I mean, some of these fibers are have uh, crystalline uh, components. Yeah. Others are uh, electrically sensitive. And so they seem to be hooking into various systems of the body, almost as if they've been designed to do so. And um, it occurred to me, you know, this might, this, one of the reasons, one of the things that people talk about, the, the mark of the beast and the, and the implanted chip and stuff like that, one of the reasons an implanted chip wouldn't really work effectively is because it would have a very limited range, because it have no significant power source, plus it would have no way of hooking into any, any other parts of the body. There's no network. But Morgellons could do that, and it is doing it. If it created an internal network, it could hook into a chip. Mm-hmm. Bingo. You've got yourself a wired human being. Doug, stand by. We've got to take our final break. Doug Elwell, a very interesting man. Doug's going to be joining us on a regular basis, Sexo Nation. And uh, Morgellons, I've, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm, that is, that's got the wheels going in the old mind over here. We'll have to get a hold of the people at Morgellons and uh, see what we can do about bringing all this together. www.ireland.mysteriousworld.com is Doug's website. And uh, Doug and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue live and around the world right here on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Doug Elwell is our special guest. Doug, do you think there's a lot of information that is being held back by, by the, um, let's say, the Vatican that should be in the Bible, that the people should know about, but yet they're censoring it? I do believe that there were things that were purposely hidden uh, in the translations. Some of them, there have been words that have been left out. For example, when I was retranslating uh, Ezekiel 1 Mm -hmm. and the chariot of of God in Ezekiel, you know, the the, the Merkava, as it's called, um, it literally describes what it sounds like. uh, It actually says in the text uh, what uh, Ezekiel saw was this great red eye with two horns on either side of it on top of some sort of square platform flying towards him. Uh, I, I realize that that sounds much like our emerging theory of what the Ark of the Covenant was, because the Ark of the Covenant you know, was actually a scaled-down version of the Merkaba. It literally says, uh, I think it's in Kings, that uh, King David described the uh, Ark of the Covenant as the chariot, because it was modeled after the chariot. It's literally a scale model of the Merkaba. And uh, the, the translation we have of Ezekiel is little to do with what the Hebrew says in many instances. And there are many other points where words have been left out and the translations have been fudged, possibly purposely, I believe, in order to hide the fact that there were references to high technology, the understanding of which was so dangerous that the people in charge decided that it was necessary to cover it up. So that's where the reference to the... Uh... The, fr- uh, the fruit of the tree of knowledge comes from. Yes. In fact, uh, the tree of knowledge uh, may have actually been more of a computer-like device than an actual mm-hmm. tree. And we'll talk about that at length in our, in our series on the Exodus Revelation. Well, we're going to look forward to reading that, Doug. And I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight. You'll be with us in three weeks. And uh, thanks very much for being there. Thank you. All right, Doug, take care of yourself. Uh, Doug Elwell, 
www.irelandmysteriousworld.com. That's www.irelandmysteriousworld.com. One eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five is toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and this is the Exxon on the Talk Star Radio Network. When we come back from the commercial break with the news at the top of the hour, we're going to be speaking with Colleen Dietzman and Paul Bowersock. We're going to be talking about shamanic and how we can prepare for the new age that lies ahead. Also on tonight's show, we'll be speaking to our good friend Douglas James Cottrell, Canada's very own Edgar Casey, and he'll be taking your calls at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. And then in hour number four, Brian O'Day will be with us. Brian is uh, the author of a new book that is that is just sweeping the uh, the nation. He's been on Oprah. CNN is going to feature Brian on Monday. It's entitled Hi, H-I-G-H. That's still to come tonight here on the X-Zone on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Once again, our toll-free number is one 528 8255 My email address, X-Zone at TalkStarRadio.com. On MSN Messenger, TalkStarRadio at Hotmail.com. And our websites, www.xzoneradio.com and www.xzonetv.com. I'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue live and around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. 